homeless situation mm -hmm. in the city of New Haven. You've been executive director of Liberty Services for about six years. Right. What have you seen over the course of those six years? Well, I think there's been a lot of state and federal investment in homeless services. I mean, no one really believes in the United States anyone should be homeless. So we've got really two things going on. We've got state and federal investments, which are now starting to pay off, programs that are starting. We've started several different programs in the last six years that are helping to get people off the street. So that's the positive. Now the negative is the fact that we're in the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. So we've got these two countervailing factors, but essentially in New Haven, we've been making good progress and we are not seeing the numbers going up. The numbers are have been flat for the last couple of years, which is really an amazing feat for social service agencies like Liberty to be able to do that. Now you said to me, give or take, there's about 600 homeless at any given time right. in New Haven. It goes up, it goes down, right. but it, it's about that area. Who is the typical client that Liberty Services serves? Okay, well that's a very good question because actually when you talk about people who are homeless, there's a spectrum. There are people who have been hurt economically, who have you know, been in, say, a house that's been foreclosed or an apartment that's been foreclosed. And so those are people who will be in a shelter or an emergency situation for a short period of time and then get themselves back into some sort of situation with a small amount of help. The population that Liberty is dealing with, on the, on the other hand, are people who are in shelters for long periods of time, who are on the streets for long periods and of time. these are single men and women. Single men and women who really have no, have term, have like lost a lot of the connection with their support system. And so they're basically very challenged in terms of maintaining housing due to either medical problems. We see a lot of people with HIV mental health issues, addiction issues. Um, so basically they're very challenged in terms of maintaining their housing. And those are the people that we deal with. As far as homelessness, and, and you talked about, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're in the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. Some people would say that I'm just a paycheck or two right. away from homelessness, that this can happen to anybody. And so Liberty Service is there to pick up the pieces for a lot of that population right. that is chronically in a downturn situation. Right. right. I mean, it really can happen to anybody because it's a, you know, a medical problem and a mental health problem that's untreated. Really, I mean, it can affect anybody. And we have people in our program who have come from wealthy families. People have that's come from point. dire poverty. That's my point. You think it can happen to you, yeah. but it can. It can. And so you need, I mean, and, and each person really has their own kind of unique solution to this. Some people need a ton of support. They need to see someone maybe weekly, daily in some cases to make sure that they're keeping their finances together, that they're seeking treatment, that they're you know, trying to connect with the services that are available to them, that they're not isolated. And then other people, as I said, it's just, it's a temporary situation that they will never be homeless again and they just needed a little bit of help, a couple months rent to get back into a um, permanent situation. Are we helping folks with mental illness enough? Do we need more services in this state? Well, I think that we have good services in, this, in the state of Connecticut. I think we are you know, blessed to be in a state that really has invested in that. I mean, I think, again, it's individual by individual. Some people really, I think a lot of people that we see have probably not been aware of the problem until it became so significant they couldn't avoid it. I mean, mm -hmm. I've heard people say, you know, I really didn't know my situation. I didn't seek out help until I was really on the street. So I think it's there, but I think the challenge is having people choose to access it. Um, there's still a lot of stigma about seeking mental health treatment. Um, despite and why is that? Um, I mean, we, you know, here we have a situation that happened in Newtown, right. and apparently there was some mental illness there. Right. We've got to identify these people and get them help. Right. I still think there's, I mean, I still think that there is a lot of stigma around it that people say, you know, we have people say, I'm not crazy, and it's not necessary. I mean, it, I think people feel of it, feel it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a segment of the population. They don't want to identify themselves as mentally ill. They don't want to be labeled as such. And so I think, and then I think the treatments themselves are sometimes um, difficult. I mean, we have people who take medication, they mm -hmm. have side effects, they feel better, they don't want to take the medication anymore. So there's a lot of challenges. I think, med I think we still don't know a lot about mental health treatment compared to what we know about medical. You know, if you have 
a certain diagnosis, medical diagnosis, it's, it's kind of clear what you're supposed to do. Mental health, there's still a lot of debate about how to treat people and what the best treatments are. So we're still learning a lot, and I think it's a great state, and we have great medical facilities, but I still think there's a lot to learn. So we're working on it. So we have your, your website mm -hmm. up here, and you have a picture of folks waiting outside. Right. You're in need of some help. What yeah. do you need? Well, let me talk about a couple of things that are going on. One is that during the winter months, we have a Sunday brunch that we do every Sunday, which is really kind of a way for people to get through the day. A lot on Sunday, so it's one meal one that meal. they're going to get yeah. on Sunday. Um, because of what happens on Sundays, there are a lot. Of, a lot of the services are closed because agencies are closed. They don't operate seven days a week. So, on Sunday, there's a lot of downtime for people who are either in the shelter or on the street because there's not a lot of places to go. So. We started a Sunday brunch program in the winter about four or five years ago in the worst of the downturn, and we've continued that. So, Can anybody show up for this, yeah, or do they have really, to be in Liberty Services? No, it's anyone that's open to the public. Anyone can show up, and basically we serve whoever comes in. And where, do you, where do you serve this? We do it at 210 State Street, which is our okay. safe haven building. And we, you know, it's a really, it is a brunch uh, similar to what you would get as if you went to a restaurant. I mean, it's fresh fruit. It's very good food. So. Um, you know, it's kind of a really pick-me-up for people who the rest of their day is going to be trying to just kill time. And if you've ever been hungry, yeah, you can't think, you can't no. work. How many people typically show up to We this have brunch? about um, 75 every Sunday. Um, and so we, when we say call for help, we have enough funding to get us through, um, I think it's like the third or fourth week in February. We'd like to continue it through the spring, so um, we're looking for donations to continue to be able to keep it open until the spring comes. And then during the spring, people aren't as you know. There's more They're when more you're when you're outside. It's not you're not you know getting hit by the elements as much. So would you like to keep it open though year round? I think we would like to keep it open more frequently. I think it does get to be kind of. Um, you know, one of these things where if it's a little repetitive, people move on to other things. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, this summer, really, I don't think it's quite as necessary as it is. Like, a winter day without anywhere to go is pretty, you know, depressing. Can you <laughs> volunteer with, with Liberty yes. to help out? Uh, and how do you do that? Um, they would just contact our website. They could contact me or um, our, our um, development office and say they want to come down and help with the brunch. And um, we'd love to have them come. How hard is it for you all to get funding? Obviously you have your sources and you get right. it, but in this economy everybody's right. getting into the cookie jar and they, <laughs> they, need, they need cash. So what's the best way to help Liberty so that they can help somebody that's on the streets? Well I think the thing is so we have the again a, a donation for that would be great. We have as the website says we have a cut-a-thon which is uh, sponsored by the Ramage Salon up on Chapel Street mm -hmm. and the stylists are donating their afternoon so we have haircuts, chair massages, and so that's a fun way to kind of spend an afternoon and, the don and all the donations come to us. And then we have this event that's happening in April. We're having a fashion show, which we've done every, um, every year. Which and I so, get to emcee this which year. Which you're going to emcee for us. Yeah, so, so there's a lot of things to get involved in if people want to, you know, uh, get involved in any way, either through seeing what coming to our, one of our events, making a donation. It all goes to help people who are homeless who are trying to get themselves back into housing. As executive director of Liberty, what are you taking away from this job? Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's been really an eye-opening experience for me. I grew up in New Haven. I uh, went here t to school. So, you know, I really felt like I knew what New Haven was, but I was in a different field for 20 years. I was in the healthcare field. So what I take from it is I just take from the fact that there's so many circumstances really I didn't understand, and still I don't fully under, I don't completely understand. So it's opened my mind to, you know, a lot of different struggles that people go through that you can't really even understand, but you can begin to try to kind of try to put the pieces back together. So it's been, I, I, it's been a wonderful experience for me. We have, you know, we all know that we live in a state with a tremendous amount of contrast. And so the, the sort of direness of people's situations in New Haven really wasn't known to me except on a, you know, intellectual basis. Mm -hmm. I'd read about it or stuff. So it's been really a fascinating journey for me to kind of 
be able to um, in, be involved in this work. And I think New Haven is a great place. We have a lot of great social service agencies. We have good funding, so I think we can make good progress in New Haven, and we have made good progress. In closing, can you share a story that stands out that might get somebody who's watching this yeah. to pay attention and learn about what Liberty Services is instead of saying, oh, well, that's not right. for me, and I'm never going to need that, and why should I help them? My money's going. Right. What, give me a story, and maybe it's somebody who fell into a really bad hole that never thought they were there. Well, I, you know, I, there's a story that's kind of amazing to me because, it's, again, sometimes, sometimes what people describe as to what happened in terms of them getting down into a bad place is some traumatic event, something terrible that happened. Their mother was shot or something like that. And then sometimes it's more a general, they just fell in with the wrong circle. And I remember we, have a we had an individual who I remember talking about and saying, well, how come you grew up in New Haven? And he had a serious heroin addiction for 15 years. And, you know, I think people, there's a lot of kind of, uh, I don't know, um, there's a lot of, could someone actually, after having that, turn their life around? And the answer was yes, because he basically decided at one point he didn't want to do this anymore. He lived in one of our programs uh, for a couple of years, and then he moved on to another program where he was employed. He got a part-time job. He, you know, got connected to his family, and, you know, what that, the other part about what happens is not really just about the one individual, because he would describe the fact that for a while, like, he had children, his children were ashamed of him, they were disconnected from him, and now, like, he's enabled, he's able to bring a lot of positive to people's lives. He's, he was reconnected with his mother, who, you know, he never could... He never he he felt such shame because he had stolen from her, and now he's reconnected with her. So it really, it doesn't. The individual affects the whole community. The whole community, when someone does positive things and shows positivity in their life, it really reverberates. And so when you can help someone turn their life around, it affects a lot more people than just that person. John Bradley, thanks very much oh, for thanks. coming on. Thanks I for appreciate having. it. Looking nice. forward to working yeah, with you. Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah.